Hello and welcome to a new interview from MinMax. MinMax is a place about games, friends, getting better. I am Ben Hansen. Thank you for being here. I'm very excited for this interview today. It's about Nobody Saves the World, which is a new game out on Steam and Xbox right now on Game Pass uh, from Drinkbox Studios, who you might know from their games like Tales from Space, About a Blob, Mutant Blob's Attack, Guacamelee, Guacamelee 2, obviously severed a couple of years ago. Their new game, Nobody Saves the World, is an action RPG 2D Zelda-esque, but with the addictive gameplay of a Diablo and the class management of a Final Fantasy Tactics. The point is, is it's excellent. So for this interview, we talked to Ian and Augusto from Drinkbox Studios about the game's development, where it came from, challenges along the way, cut characters, all that fun stuff. So we hope you enjoy the interview. You can always unlock the podcast version of this interview over on Patreon at patreon.com slash minmax with two ends. Help support more interviews like it. Unlock all of our other interviews, deepest dives that we've done, everything like that. Or if you appreciate the interview at any point in general or appreciate the timestamps below for different points in the discussion, we'd always appreciate it if you subscribe to MinMax's channel and help spread the word. All right, without further ado, here's Ian and Augusto. Ian and Augusto, welcome to MinMax, guys. Hey, thanks for having us. Thanks. Yeah, honor to have you. Let's see, just so people know voices. Ian, you are lead designer for Nobody Saves the World, yes? Yes, that is me. Okay, recognize that voice. Augusto, concept lead. Hello, Augusto, welcome. Hello, thanks for having me. Uh, so, time and place, everybody. Very important. Uh, we're recording this the week before Nobody Saves the World releases. Uh, right now, how are you two feeling about the game? Everything. Give me your state of mind right now. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Please. Uh, um, anxious, cautiously optimistic. <laughs> like, I think we made a pretty darn cool game, but you never know how it's going to land. So just like hoping for the best. Yeah. What about you, Augusta? Yeah, same. Just like I was telling the end the other day, like just uh, the month leading up to launch is always so stressful because... Most of the artwork is already done. It's just like patching stuff and testing. Right. And so you're kind of sitting and you kind of <laughs> just, you know, the anxiousness just builds up. So, but I agree. I think it, like everyone in the studio likes the game after playing it like thousands of times. So that's always a good sign. Yeah. So yeah, I'm very, I'm very proud of it. I'm very excited to share it. Yeah. I mean, Ian, you say cautiously optimistic. Have you done enough testing or where's that optimism coming from? Is it just the strength of the team or have you done like enough mock reviews to be like, all right, I think we're on top of this. Um, I mean, good guesses, at least all of the above. Like yeah. we've done a lot of play testing and everyone's cons like testers are consistently at like responding very positively to the game, telling us how much like fun they had. Um, yeah, even people who don't really like owe us anything, who are like begging to be honest. So like, so hopefully, and you know, the the team is great, and we all get along great, and I think we did great work. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Just about everything. I mean, from my perspective, I have no idea what the rest of the world is like. Uh, but this game is f***ing awesome. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> you two! Like, Thank I got you. a code last Friday, and it has uh, destroyed my world. Uh, I mean. <laughs> I've been playing it every second that I can throughout the weekend and whatnot, and I haven't finished it quite yet. I'm like level 52, so to imagine oh, I'm, yeah. I'm getting right there, right? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, okay. up, yeah. yeah uh, so I love this game. It feels like it's the best case scenario where it came in completely out of the blue, where it's like, yeah, a new drink box game, and you know, I think this is a sign of respect. Uh, hopefully you take it that way, but it was like, drink box. Yeah, they've been working for it. I bet they're really good about now. I should go back and shoot and see what they're doing. <laughs> and then this game completely went away. I didn't even know, like, the premise. So it was, like, the best way to jump into this thing. Be like, oh, okay. So I'm a rat. Okay, got it. Oh, okay. And then it just keeps layering systems and systems until, before I know it, I cannot go to sleep each and every night. So thank you for your work <laughs> so far. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah that definitely. was like, exactly the plan. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was also a bit of a challenge of making the game. It's just like those layers and like to paste those and get, you know, the the sweet spot at each of those layers. I think that was fun discovering how, how to make this game. Yeah. Uh, how did you all pull this off? Where did this come from? Um, uh, Ian, did you wake up one morning and say, of course, layers and layers of progression. No gamer can say no to that. <laughs> <laughs> no um actually it came from like the whole team like when we finish a project then we kind of like solicit ideas from the whole team and we all like talk in a group and share them 
And I think the core of this one came from Chris Harvey, who's like the lead coder and one of the co-founders of the studio. Um, and I think the initial core of it was like inspired by the job system of Final Fantasy Tactics, like with how many jobs there are and they can like uh, cross pollinate with their abilities. And also the idea of like constantly having these quests firing off, just like little hits right. of dopamine or whatever. Yeah, mission accomplished. <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, but then like everything after that was just, I think like just iteration and constantly finding like, okay, well, you can be like 18 different forms and a million different abilities, but like, how do you actually make people use them? Because some people will be like, well, I like the rat. And like, I literally won't play anything except the rat. Totally. And like, I won't customize the rat. So it's like, just, yeah, a lot of time spent creating the systems that encourage people to do that. But it turns out you just give a little bit of an incentive and then people start to realize that, you know what? All these characters are fun to play. You know, at first it's like, bodybuilder who wants to play as the bodybuilder i'm busy over <laughs> here with my mermaid and then at times it's like okay now bodybuilder has become my go-to and it's like every new character i unlock it's always that feeling of like well i won't be using this freak and then i learn to love the <laughs> new freak and it becomes my new default so yeah it's an awesome awesome job of just incentivizing people to keep on rolling keep experimenting i mean i think a big part of that as i'm sure you're aware is like the dungeons and having to be like okay this dungeon you should have somebody with these types of attacks and was that something that also came on late for just trying to encourage people to to keep shaking it up yeah totally um i think we tried more like quote unquote obvious things first like we're like oh people enemies will have like resistances and like strengths against different attacks but it just like didn't really read well like if an enemy is going to take like four more hits with your rat to kill, you're like, well, I'm not going to change from the rat. I'm just going to keep totally, hitting it. Totally. So then, yeah, things like the wards, the shields, uh, the mods. Yeah, those came in after. A dumb technical question. Um, how much is randomized in this game? Uh, um, okay. I mean, the overworld's all hand designed. Right. But like conditions the of dungeons, are those set? Like if I played this thing again? The conditions of the dungeons are set, but, you know, there's certain modes in the game that will remix them. Interesting. Okay. Looking forward you may to... find. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Besides that, it's just like the layouts of the dungeons and the... Yeah, the layouts of the dungeons and the specific placements of enemies are random. But, like, in the broad scheme of things, they're still pretty designed. Like, you know... We know that, oh, this one's going to be a bunch of arenas, or this one's going to, you know, I don't know, have poison all in it, and be three floors of progressing difficulty, like, whatever the broad scope. Broad strokes are designed, but yeah, like, the smaller pieces are still randomly put together. Gotcha. Uh, Augusto, how was the development in general for you this time around? It was very interesting. It was... uh... (laughs) I think the the initial part was a bit tough because we were working on kind of other pitches and developing stuff. And for this game in particular, the strong part was the design, the systems, what was what was unique. So then on the art side, the concept side, it was a bit tough to get the right tone and the right mix of things. So it was like a lot of uh, a trial and error as opposed to say guacamole which we knew was like mexican world and very graphic design or something like that and we start developing this was like just just trial and error for the first maybe <laughs> like it feels like a quarter of the, <laughs> of the production and also it was a long production so it was just constantly layering those things and, um so yeah it was it was unique but also different exciting uh, challenging and it's a departure from the type of game we've done because yeah. this, this is top down. So it's a, a different set of rules. We've never done that. So it's like making the engine do that and having the art team design things and like Mauricio doing the animation is like, we need to animate the characters doing this three times, you know? <laughs> and at the beginning, we're like, oh, are we going to do like full rotations or like eight directions? And like, no, it's just too expensive. And like that kind of thing. And you have abilities that can be customized. So that means that other people can, other characters can use it. Yeah. And you know, you run the numbers, it's just exponentially <laughs> like you cannot have this. So then developing a system that allows us to, you know, not, not go crazy with just having to polish animations for three years. Totally. And it is so weird going into this game blind 
um, uh, like, I don't, maybe I saw a trailer a while ago and forgot about it. Forgive me, please. Cause now I'm kicking myself. Like I should have been screaming about this game for the last couple of years, <laughs> but like even starting the game and then you get to be the rat and use like the bite. I'm like, that's an interesting animation choice of like having the jaws, like outside of the rat clomping. I'm like, I wonder why that is. And it's like, as the game keeps going, it's like, okay, okay, got it. It turns out that's a very, very smart choice just to make it usable for anybody here. So those types of not shortcuts, but just logical ways to make it possible to develop this game. Yeah, it is a shortcut that also would look good, right? Right, like, right. <laughs> that's, it, it needs to fit all, but also needs to feel good when you're playing it. So like, that's, you know, the nebulous challenge of that. Yeah, when you look back at, at the early days on the, on the art side, what stands out? What direction were you going down or what road were you going down that now seems absurd? Um, I think it was looking too, like, kitty kind of, mm. like... I don't know, like everything looked smaller. <laughs> and then we we made it more and more sort of grotesque in a way, <laughs> uh, but it still looks polished. So it's really hard to, to explain. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe Ian, you, you remember some of those first designs? I'm trying but, to remember. Some of them were like very simple, like, like um, a triangle man with like a, with like a triangle Zelda hat on him. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, what's well, more more graphic design? I, I guess it's, it's still a residue of guacamole. So it was mm. more like primary shapes and primary colors. Gotcha. Um, and then it, it evolved into, I, once we added the new lighting system, like the whole game just turned like beautiful. <laughs> That's nice. That's awesome. <laughs> like the coders and staff did a great job with that. Yeah, Definitely. Ian. When you look back at like the, the early days of the project, what stands out to you for like the biggest biggest head scratchers, biggest challenges for like how what are we making here? Let's try and wrap our minds around this thing. Oh man. It was the whole project felt like everything about it felt that way for the first couple of months, because it was like you have a character and your character's progressing, but then you have like twenty different uh, characters that that character can be and they're progressing and like how do you stop a player from like progressing in the world? Do you do it based on the player's level or the form's level or like mm. so many yeah, like, and we were going to have equipment at first. Then it was like, okay, well mm. how does that factor into things? Like, am I going to be changing equipment every time I change my form? Uh, there's just so many questions or even like, cause I don't think the studio has made, and I certainly have not made like a open world game to the extent this one's open world so right. even just the idea of like how do you stop people from just like walking to the other end of the map like is that a good idea should we let them do that like that kind of thing it just everything was a big question yeah and i guess it kind of naturally tell me if there's an epiphany that i'm missing but it's just like oh we just make the levels in those areas difficult so technically they can get through it but it's going to be a, a slog like for me i think it naturally worked for like a soft gating feel like okay go to a new area all right this is level 43 it says on the screen i'm going to come back here later type of thing that's yeah basically generally what we settled on there's like one exception where like a chunk of the world is kind of gated off from you until you reach a certain story moment right right but that's we try to do that as little as possible the first kind of test with the open world was just too open yeah. So people were like, I don't know where to, it's kind of like, they kind of freeze. It's like, am I going the right way? There's no, I, there's no funneling because it's too open. So then you have to start making paths and like kind of more discreet blockers of like, yeah, this is the highest level area or whatever. Yeah. And, oh, sorry. Just one quick note Please. is like even giving people direction. Like even we, when we had a more focused open world, like if it's like, Oh, you can go left or right, like, or up, it doesn't matter. The choice is yours. But people would be like, well, I have no context for anything. Like, what does it matter to me? Why are I go? Uh, so communicating those goals was also important. Yeah. It's going to be that weird thing of like, okay, final fantasy tactics meets link to the past 2d Zelda go. Mm -hmm. And then you have, I'll have that moment of, oh, this is incredibly hard. <laughs> like, do you do the dorky move, but very logical move of like going back and looking at some similarly structured worlds in the past and gaming past to try and analyze, like, how are they gaining people? For sure, for sure. Uh, I can't remember them anymore, but like, I, I bet just intuitively of like, oh, I played Grand Theft Auto. I remember how they blocked me off from like the, the next two islands, you know? Right, right. 
stuff like that. Do you remember any of the, the big epiphanies along the way design wise? Yes. Um, getting rid of equipment. I remember. <laughs> Cause you know, it was another one of those things where it's like, well, it's an RPG. Like, of course we're going to have equipment, but like back in the day, the four face buttons were the only customizable parts of your character. So mm. if you wanted to have like a passive ability, you would have to sacrifice an active one. Um, and you'd have those, what were now the passive slots were equ- equipment slots. Interesting. Okay. So yeah, just between having equipment, but like 20 different characters or so. So you had to keep changing it. It sucks. And like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And also, like, the limited customization, like, opportunities from only having four slots and having to, like, sacrifice an active ability for a passive ability. Like, it was just really, like, you got boxed in and you had to constantly be in the menus. So it was, it did feel like this big epiphany that design, I think the whole design team was like, yes, like, let's get rid of the equipment. And we did. And, and I think it worked out really well. So there wasn't a big debate? It wasn't a different divisions within the studio arguing about pro equipment, anti equipment? No. I don't think so. I think everyone's just pretty like invested in making the funnest thing possible. And I think they all agreed that it seemed like the right choice. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. It was definitely the right choice. And like, that's gotta be the beauty and challenge of game design is now looking back on it. It's like, yeah, why would you ever have the passive abilities take up a slot? That's such a stupid idea. But when you're in the (laughs) thick of it, you just can't see it even with all your game design experience, right? Totally. What is, Hey, what is your game design experience? How long have you both been at the studio? Like Augusto, how long have you been there? Uh, well, I've, I've been there since 2009. Uh, I came in to help finish the first game, which was about a blog. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> to play this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, for oh, like PS3. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I've been there ever since. I came in as animation, um, an animator and, and, and concept artist. And the only other artist at that time was uh, Steph. So it's like two art, two person art team. Right on. And what about you, Ian? Um, I've been at the studio for like three years, maybe. I'm really bad with time, but uh, yeah, I came on in like the last six months or so of Guacamole Two to help finish that off. Um, but I've been in games for like ten plus years. Before that, I was just like making games uh, solo, and then I joined for Guac Two. What, um, here's an impossible question for you too, but, uh, yeah, what, what defines Drinkbox? What makes it unique, you think? What makes it stand out compared to the rest of the industry from, from your perspective? Oh, I think, um, I, that's interesting. Um, one of the things that, uh, has stuck with me, um, I think Chris Harvey mentioned this, and it's like, anyone can make, uh, a great game with infinite time and infinite money. But the challenge is to make, to craft a good game with the limit, do with those limitations, with limited time and limited money. And that's, that's a challenge. And I think they're not afraid to cut things about the game to finish. The, the deadlines, we never, um, we never stay extra hours. We don't come in on weekends. Um, the scope, they're very flexible to change scope and make smart decisions. Um, so then you're, you just, you know, feel like you have a life. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's really special given what I hear from the other parts of the industry. For sure. So just kind of smart production. Is it just the vibe of the studio or a couple of smart producers in particular who are good about mapping things out and keeping people on track? I feel like the... All, the, all three founders, uh, Graham, Chris, and Ryan, are really good at that stuff. Uh, they just yeah. have a knack for that, and they set the tone. And yeah, hundred percent. And like from the perspective of a designer, they're also like really good designers. Mm. Like, obvi- so so is the rest of the design team. Like Cass and Steele are great, and then we bring them to Chris, uh, Graham, and Ryan, and then even the founders can weigh in and be like, no, 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 here's like a good design, like you know, thing you didn't think of, or like they, they all just have really great instincts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any surprising bit of feedback for, for this one where somebody had a very good idea that the design team didn't think of? Yes. Um, 
I don't know how I could possibly communicate it well in a short period of time, but like hey, the man, way the leveling. Need. <laughs> okay. Well, for a long, long time, the way the world leveled up, like there was so much debate of like, oh, well, if it levels up with you, then what's the point of leveling up your character? Yep. If it doesn't level up with you, what's the point of an open world where I can walk into an area I've never been and it's like 20 levels below me and I just kill everyone? Like, uh, and I think like Chris Harvey had an idea about like dynamically scaling up the world based on like a bunch of different factors. And if you've completed this dungeon or if you've entered this world before, huh. and it was just, at least I remember in the meeting when he presented it, he just seemed to do it almost off the cuff. Like, well, why don't we just do this? And I was like, Oh yeah, we can do that. Let's do that. So just a more complicated trigger for leveling up parts of the world. That's kind of the, the uh, epiphany. Yes. Okay. Cause I think it, it works really well now. Like, you know, in the middle of the game or so where you're kind of choosing to go to the left or the right like i definitely got my ass kicked a fair amount uh, in that <laughs> middle section and then it was like the the feeling of kind of like walking downhill like okay now i'll go to the right and i feel like there's a couple areas where i'm a couple levels too high and it just it feels really good after struggling in a dungeon against a boss for a long time so <laughs> from my perspective so far i think uh, you really pulled it off um Sweet. what uh going back to the design of the game what uh what about choosing characters it has to be a very fun day, very fun couple years. Is there just a whiteboard where everybody's throwing ideas up there? Like, what was the most fun part of that process? Oh, man. Augusto definitely has to weigh in on this, too. But, <laughs> <laughs> like, I wish I could show it. I wish I could bring it up. But, like, I, Augusto, maybe Mautu, at the very beginning of the project, to, like, get us excited about the project and, like, explore the ideas uh like oh, you just created this awesome image of like all these like form ideas like one was like ham and stairs and then when you master both of them you can get the hamster form and like you know like different like rogues and mages and thieves and like dogs and cats and whatever like uh so sorry the, this is a long way to say that i think art and design influence each other like art would look at that image and be like oh man what is ham how do you play ham and then we'd try and figure it out or we'd be like oh i have a really cool idea for you know an egg uh can we make this happen and then art you know makes it look awesome and has a bunch of ideas too <laughs> augusto are you looking for that image right now i am i am <laughs> if you find uh, it that'd be I, awesome. I can i can send it to you as you can post it yeah this, that'd be great yeah i'd love to put it up on the screen um yeah, I think I, I can I can post it here in the chat just for reference for you. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, this was one of the first sketches um, that I did, and it was um, back then. You were not even nobody. You were right. an apprentice. Right. You wanted to start with Nostromagus, and so the idea of leveling up. Uh, but at, at that point, you were leveling up and changing form every time you leveled up, kind of like a Pokemon evolution kind of thing. Gotcha. So, but some were like traditional, like, you know, mage apprentice to, you know, sorcerer and stuff like that. But yeah. some were just stupid, like <laughs> nerd, super nerd, right. like a, a floating brain after that or something. <laughs> and then you have like, a, <laughs> my favorite, I wish we did was uh, you had to unlock the horse and then you had to unlock the ranger and then you become, uh, you can do the centaur. Oh, and then smart. the evolution of that is like a reverse centaur. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like a horse head in <laughs> that awesome yeah. form. That's amazing. So what, what kind of killed the, the evolution idea? Uh, it was just too much work. It was just a lot because um, I had to come up with different um, abilities for that. I mean, maybe Ian, you would know better, but it, it was just uh, the scope was just too much. And so we wanted to focus on the ones that we could do well. Um, but th that here, the great thing about concept is that as the first ideas and there's no, you know, worrying about scope so you can make it as silly and crazy. And then that, that sparks some of those ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, is this the type of game where you can be a year into development and then think, you know, it'd be a really fun character or were you guys pretty strict about like, okay, this is the phase where we're creating characters and then we need to stop. Please stop brainstorming everybody, no matter <laughs> what. <laughs> um, no, I think 
up until like the last, I don't know, three months, six months, like we were putting in forms. Uh, we didn't, I don't think we wanted to close the door until we absolutely had to, because it's just like, those are the coolest parts of the game, at least in my opinion. Uh, so to get as many of them in as we can, like that's, that's the goal. Yeah, totally. It's, it's awesome. Uh, what, um, what builds were really broken along the way? Maybe towards the latter half of development. Were there combos that you all didn't see coming that people just shattered the game with? I think the design team would flag them before. (laughs) No, there's some, like... um, I know there was an ability... Okay, you can, like, Holy Light, if you know it, for anyone who doesn't, it's like it hits everyone on the screen repeatedly very fast. Yeah. Um, And then abilities that let your hits build status effects... And then there was one more ability that when you applied status effects to someone, they'd explode. So way back in the project, those three things together would be basically like you press a button and everyone on the screen just explodes. That's pretty good, though. (laughs) It was pretty cool to find it. But then when like it was weird. Every playtester for a while was finding it and they would just like explode the whole screen, explode the whole screen. And then (laughs) we're just watching it like, what do we put all this work and all these abilities for? (laughs) So, uh, yeah. But I mean, that's still in the game. It's just not as like dominating as it was. Right. Because I'm trying to remember, is it because of the holy light? It has like a specific, you can't poison the entire screen with it. Is that the way it goes? Or just trying to remember Uh, what's limiting that? Or should I be doing um, this move? I bet the, there's so many like (laughs) tuning things that have happened. I might be wrong, but it's something like it probably has like a reduced status build and the explosion probably just isn't so big. It used to be very big. Like it would just fill the screen with explosions, but now it's more sensible. That's fantastic. I mean, that's kind of the the fun thing about these types of games is when you feel like you are kind of breaking it, like when I have multiple familial generators on the screen Mm. at the same time. And for like some of those boss fights where it is just like, I'm amazed my Series X isn't melting at this point with the (laughs) amount of characters and explosions on the screen, but it's so satisfying. And so it has to be so fun to allow players to feel like they're breaking stuff, but like, ah, still within the design, it's fair game. Totally. That's the totally. That's spot. the dream. Yeah. So congratulations. <laughs> You've actually pulled off the dream. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Augusto, do you have any favorite combos that you recommend for people checking out the game? Uh, wow. Um, I don't know. I like the holy light to apply um, the effects. Um, I don't know. I don't have, I, I switch around a lot. I don't know if I have like a specific one, Yeah. but I want to come back to like the, um, when we're doing this, where you were talking about this waves of like, we got to design forms or we got to do this. Um, one of my favorite things was every time we had like a big playthrough with everybody, uh, we had like, w- what was your favorite form or your favorite abilities? And everybody would have different ones, awesome. which was great. And sometimes some would be like the least favorite ones, and then the next build, those would be the favorite ones because <laughs> work was put into the into them. So right. the ones that were suck at the beginning, then the next one, someone would be like, "This one's awesome. Nobody's playing it, but like this one's my new favorite." So I I love that part yeah. of the process. What are you looking forward to when the wider internet starts tearing this game apart and really min maxing it? No pun intended. Uh, hmm. Are you looking forward to seeing that Reddit just explode with weird runs and weird combos? That would be lovely. I mean, you're acting like it's going to be hypothetical. There's going to be absolutely like nobody uh, only runs all that stuff. Did, yeah, you, can't wait. did you say nobody only runs? <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to happen, right? That would be great. Yeah, yeah. It, that's part of the the fun of this is that you realize you're not as good at your game that you've been playing for three years and making as like someone that just picked it up <laughs> and, like, two days later. They're like, I found this thing, how to, to do this. And like, yeah, it blows my mind every time. Yeah. Especially with this thing on game pass, I don't want to predict your futures for you, but I think a lot of people are going to be jumping in and having a lot of thoughts about different builds and everything. <laughs> like at what point in the project did that come on board? The, the game pass deal. Oh man. I don't know if you can remember Augusto. I like it maybe a year ago, maybe maybe before. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, not not like in the last few months, but right. Um earlier. 
Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, okay, I guess I have a very specific question for you. Yeah. Uh, there is a room with a bunch of swords on the wall, a bunch of video game Easter egg swords. Um, yeah. I'm having a tough time identifying two of them. And if you could help me out, I'd really appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. Okay, the kind of bigger one, not the Buster Sword, obviously, but the second biggest one, it's in the upper middle. I don't remember, because Steph put those. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. We'll have to ask him. Okay. Uh, do you know the dagger by chance? What that is from? I don't. Know. Okay. Mm. All right. It can it's just, a mystery. Yeah. <laughs> Look, but <be> yeah, <laughs> send the picture. Like I can give you a chart after. For sure. <laughs> it's like that kind of stuff is like Steph just throws in like Easter eggs and things like that, and you keep finding them after. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see other things that y'all learned from the project. Like Ian, what do you think is the biggest lesson from wrapping this thing up? Oh man, I can't think of one single thing except maybe this is my first time being like a lead designer. So yeah. just working with the team and you know, um, yeah, I just, I don't know how to summarize it, but it's just been a very fresh and exciting experience for me. Yeah. Any surprises uh, about being a lead designer that you was different than you expected? You did a great job, Ian. It's like, I Thanks, mean, man. You've, you've done games all your life, but like, it was like, like having a seasoned designer in the team. I, I really appreciate it. And I don't know, I guess there were no surprises because I didn't know what to expect and I had no expectations. I was just like, kind of, yeah, enjoying the process. I'll give a, can I take this opportunity to give a shout out to Cass and Steele, the other designers on the team? Cause of course. they made it easy cause they're great. So yeah. Nice. And I mean, a majority of this game's development was done remotely then. Maybe like half, maybe half. Okay. That transition worked okay for the team. Yeah. Surprisingly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the studio, we're just plugged in and like mm. using instant message anyway. <laughs> right. That's true. The studio is like very, well, sorry, you go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, if you went into the studio on any given day, you'd probably be very, very quiet. And we're all just like listening to tunes or whatever, like just working away. And then if someone has a question, one person will be like, Hey, can you help me? Blah, blah, blah. But like, so it kind of may as well be remote, except <laughs> Obviously, in person is way more easy to collaborate, but yeah, yeah I, I, like, the way there. you know, I know Greg Kasavin has talked about like the challenge of remote is really going to be hit when starting up a new project, yeah. when it needs to be a little bit more free flowing ideas pouring out of people instead of, all right, this is the meeting where we talk about what we're doing next, which I guess you kind of have to do naturally. So I'd imagine the team is bracing for impact on that one. I'm sure it's already even begun, right? Yeah, yes and yes. Okay. Racing for impact, start, very slowly starting. Yeah. Uh, if this game is as successful as I think it will be, and I could be wrong, but as I think it will be, like, uh, do you feel energized about the project? Do you feel open for exploring this more in the future? I mean, sure, yeah. Like, I think if it does that well, that would be incredibly gratifying, and I think we'd all be excited to give people more of it if they wanted it. Yeah, I just want to do the reverse centaur. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get that in there. <laughs> Got to build up to that point. Awesome. Well, again, hats off to the entire team for pulling this off. Uh, I cannot wait to finish it uh, very soon. It is, hey, it's my game of the year right now, and I'd be, <sighs> honestly, it is excellent, excellent, excellent. It, it is working on so many levels that I wasn't expecting. So congratulations to the entire team. Um, any any Thank final predictions? Because I think this is fun, having this timestamp thing. Any final predictions for the game and its level of success? You want to predict a Metacritic score? Anything bold like that? Ha! Ha! I'll let Agusa <laughs> answer first. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> All right. Okay, well then just uh, make it up to me. Do you two want to have like a jam session with your guitars behind you or anything? Ha! We should. We should, Ian. We haven't. Yeah. Okay. Fun. All right. Save it for the next interview. That's fine. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much, you two. I really appreciate your time. And thank you so much thank for you, watching or listening to this interview from MinMax. You can always subscribe to our channel, check out our other interviews. We'd appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much, everybody.
Bye! If you are sick of snark, clickbait, and an avalanche of movie news, you can help support independent games media by subscribing to MinMax's YouTube channel here, or checking out the benefits over on Patreon. It's a nice, clean handshake. You support us, and we won't make dumb, condescending stuff for you. Your support helps us continue our mission of focusing on games, friends, and getting better. Patreon.com slash MinMax with two N's. We'd appreciate it.